Okay, so uh, welcome everyone to today's uh, TCS Plus with uh, Alex and um, Before we start, I should thank all my fellow co-organizers, uh, Anindya De, Thomas Vidi, Gautam Kamat, uh, Clement Canon, and Ilya Rosenstein. Um, and uh, as usual, our tradition is to go around the table. So let, let me try to introduce all the groups. Um, we have um, Esan uh, with the group from USC. Hello, Esan. We have Erfan with the group from Indiana. Hello, Erfan. Thanks for joining. Uh, we have uh, G from uh, the Simons. Hello. Hi, everyone there from the Simons Institute. Uh, we have uh, Reza and I'm not sure actually where from. Uh, I can't find it on my list, but welcome. Uh, we have uh, Shravas from uh, NYU, a few floors above me here. Hi, guys. Uh, Slobodan from MIT. Hello, everyone. And this looks like, is it Tom? Yeah, I think it's, yeah, it's uh, Thomas Vidik from the group from Caltech. We have Toronto. Uh, Chris joining us, from the group from Toronto. Hi, everyone. Welcome. Uh, we have Yasamin joining us from uh, Johns Hopkins. Hello, welcome. And Yijun Chang from University of Michigan. Good to see you. And I think that's probably all for now. Um, so today's speaker is um, uh, Alex, uh, Alex Andoni. Um, just a few words before we start the talk and just um, uh, present Alex. Alex is. Uh, had his PhD uh, at MIT with uh, Piotr Indyk. Uh, he graduated in 2009. He was a postdoc uh, at uh, Princeton for a year and then spent um, about five years in the Microsoft research. He's now a professor in, uh, in Colombia. His interests are in high dimension geometry, metric embeddings, um, algorithms for uh, massive data. And today he's going to tell us about graph connectivity um, in log diameter rounds. So um, welcome, Alex. All right. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, and thanks for inviting me to the famous DCS uh, Plus talks. Uh, it's a pleasure to finally give a talk here. Uh, my Definitely my most distributed talk. Uh, and I'll talk about uh, parallel algorithms for graph connectivity. Uh, and I shall mention that this is joint work with uh, Zhao Song, uh, Cliff Stein, Zhengi Wang, and Pei Lin Zhang. Okay, so let's start. Uh, so first of all, I mean, the, the, the general motivation for uh, this research, uh, this paper and some previous papers uh, came from wild success of uh, parallel, mm, modern parallel systems, uh, in particular systems where, which were designed with many computers in mind, which are trying to solve one big task. Uh, and you know, I'm sure you have heard many of these modern systems before, such as MapReduce, Hadoop, Dryad, Spark, and many others. And uh, I mean, of course, I'm here not to talk about the systems, but more of the theory uh, of the systems. Uh, and in particular, uh, the, the success of the systems uh, somehow forced us to rethink a little bit the theory of uh, modern parallel computing. And uh, in particular, kind of as a theoretician, you'd kind of ask, uh, you know, there are many questions to ask, but some of the basic questions are, first of all, kind of to establish the a theoretical formal model uh, for the systems, and then think about, you know, whether this model leads to new algorithmic techniques. Okay, so first of all, let me describe the model. Um, so, uh, um, I mean, of course, this talk, this talk's contribution is mostly on the algorithmic front, but I'll describe the computational model uh, that has been established roughly in the last uh, maybe uh, nine, ten years. Okay, so you think about uh, the computation being done by P machines or processors, and each machine has some amount of space, which we denote by big S. Uh, and uh, we think that the total space, basically the number of uh, machines times the space per machine will be about uh, proportional to the input size, basically as much as input as we have. Uh, in other words, you cannot really replicate your input too much. Okay, so we have these machines and somehow we store uh, the data between themselves. Um, 
And, uh, you know, this talk is about graph algorithms, so we'll always think about input as being uh, a graph on n vertices, m edges, and uh, really the input is some graph, right? This is our you know, abstract graph uh, on m edges. And somehow at the beginning, this graph is distributed uh, in this space uh, of, uh, of these machines. So, so this is kind of split between these machines. I mean, here it's just depicted uh, by uh, the edges being split between uh, di different um, different machines. And the computation proceeds in rounds where the, each machine does some local computation. And then uh, it does what is called a shuffle all uh, uh, round, uh, which uh, basically reshuffles the data between the computers. Uh, and then, you know, again, the computers uh, do some computation on their local information, and then maybe again reshuffle the information um, and then uh, do some more computation. Okay, note that this shuffle kind of from the perspective of communicating across the network is very expensive. And in the general principle is to try to reduce as much as possible this uh, number of these shuffle operations or basically these rounds. Okay, and uh, I should mention that the output uh, oftentimes will be something which is also proportional to the input size, uh, for example, order M in this case. In particular, it doesn't fit on the machine, so the answer is not stored on one machine either, uh, but perhaps it will be stored across different machines. And uh, for example, here, one problem we'll be talking about is connectivity. Um, so for example, uh, these machines are computing, uh, are computing the connectivity of this input graph up here, and uh, the edges are now colored by the name of the connected component. So these edges represent this abstract coloration of, uh, of the graph uh, corresponding to the two connected components. Okay, and you know, perhaps this is used for some other application down the road. So, so this is the uh, this is the model. This is how computation proceeds. Basically, co local computation uh, and uh, shuffle all um, uh, repeated in a few rounds. And the main model constraints or the main cost measure, first of all, is the number of rounds. Uh, so as I already suggested, we'd like to reduce the number of rounds as much as possible. Uh, we'll also think about um, the space per machine is being something which is small polynomial. So delta, think about it as, let's say, being 0 0.1, uh, or, um, uh, or let's say it is root m. I mean, it's another uh, good number to have in mind. For example, the space equals to root m comes out just from requirement of saying that, let's say, if our space is at least as large as the number of processors, for example, because a machine has a list of all the other machines participating in this computation, then, you know, plugging the two together, uh, we immediately get the, the space per machine must be at least root of, the, of M, where M, again, is the size of the input. Okay, but in general, you can think of uh, size per machine as being some small polynomial, so uh, of the input size. Okay, and uh, this uh, bound S uh, bounds the space per machine, uh, but also kind of naturally it bounds also, for example, how much information a machine can get in a round. Uh, so the total in communication, if we sum up all the uh, sizes of the messages per machine uh, uh, per round, will also bound it by uh, order. So you know, represented by this uh, uh, red bound. Uh, and, um, you know, we might want other things from our model, for example, that we have, let's say, linear runtime uh, uh, for each machine locally per round, um, but this will not be you know, the main constraint uh, for us, and usually this will be easy to achieve in our algorithms. Okay, so, the, I mean, the main, the main focus, the main uh, cost that we measure is really the number of rounds. This, is, this will be the focus uh, in this model. Okay, and uh, uh, and this uh, model has is a culmination of uh, a number of uh, formalizations of the parallel models. In particular, it is a form of uh, what is called bulk, bulk synchronous uh, parallel model, uh, dating from nineties. Um, later, um, about ten years ago, there was. Um, and when after these uh, systems have appeared, uh, uh, a number of authors introduced uh, a MapReduce framework, which is uh, some model, which is a precursor of the current model. And the current model is uh, really introduced in this paper. Um, 
and it is called massively parallel computing or MPC. And uh, basically, since about 2013, this was the model of choice for studying the modern parallel systems. Um, I should mention that uh, I include citations here. I, I want to read the names just for interest of time. Uh, but later on, uh, some references will be abbreviated if they appeared earlier in the talk. OK. Um, all right, so this, these are the model constraints. And uh, uh, you know, what can we do? First of all, you know, the first natural question is, OK, there has been a lot of research done uh, in 80s and 90s on parallel algorithms. In particular, they were done under the, under the hood of what is called PRAM algorithms. And the question is, you know, is there, can we reuse those algorithms in our new model MPC uh, or, you know, and is there more things to be done? Uh, so first of all, you know, the good news is that, yes, we can uh, reuse uh, the PRAM uh, algorithms that were developed before. And in particular, you can get, um, for any PRAM algorithm, you can uh, get uh, the number of rounds in our model to be roughly proportional to the parallel time in the PIRA model. Okay, so basically it says that you can simulate the PIRA algorithms without a uh, significant slowdown. Okay, so this is very good. This means that we can reuse a large body of very nice algorithms. Uh, one caveat, uh, in a sense, is that typically those algorithms are at least logarithmic uh, parallel time. Uh, so I guess the, the, the most kind of classic example is uh, to consider the problem of computing uh, an XOR of N bits. Uh, so here, a uh, uh, lower bound from 89 showed that even kind of on the fanciest available PRAM, uh, which is called CRCW, uh, we need a parallel runtime, which is uh, roughly logarithmic in N. Okay, uh, so I mean, which is nice time, but the question is, you know, can we really get even better runtimes in the MPC model, given that uh, the the settings are, are somewhat different from the uh, PIRA model? And uh, basically, this uh, has led to the research goal of uh, trying to develop faster algorithms in the MPC model. In particular, for this XOR problem, uh, we can solve uh, the XOR problem in constant time uh, on MPC on a PC model, uh, so improving from logarithmic to constant. And uh, this is done basically as, you know, computing this VR tree. So here is an example. This is uh, just considering the case when the space per machine is something like n to point 0 0.5, so ro root of the number of the bits. Uh, so, the, um, so this is essentially done in just one round. Uh, at the beginning, each, let's say, input machine has uh, root n of these bits, which satisfies the space bound. Uh, now, in uh, locally, each machine computes the XOR of the bits that it has locally. So, and then it sends this uh, one bit, which XOR of its local bits, to the you know, one last machine kind of, which is, uh, which will compute the final answer. Okay, so each of, of, the, of these machines will compute the XOR, send it to this, uh, to this machine. This machine uh, has an upper bound of root n of the amount of input that it can get, but you know, since there are root n machines here, it is, uh, it is all good. And this machine can compute the, uh, the final answer, basically, the XOR of the inputs that it gets. And uh, obviously, you know, if S is less than root n, then you can generalize to you know, build this VR tree uh, of depth, which is logarithmic base, uh, logarithm base S of n, which is constant as long as S is some polynomial in n. Okay, and in general, you can think about MPC, sorry. Um, uh, you can think about MPC as uh, being a circuit where uh, you have uh, dif uh, different gates. Each gate has a fan in, which is S to n to power delta, uh, basically the bound on the space per machine. Uh, and the function that is at every gate uh, is, in a sense, an arbitrary function. Again, ideally, we'd like this function to be a nice function. It's a linear time uh, algorithm, uh, but in general, we can think about arbitrary function at the gate. Okay, so this is something to, to, to have in mind. Okay, so can we really design better algorithms, faster algorithms in the APC model? Okay, so let me try to recap a few of the research progress that has been done over the last years so since APC has been introduced. Um, so first of all, you know, to repeat something that I already suggested, that we can basically simulate any uh, classic PRAM algorithm. So in particular for the connectivity problem on graph, 
uh, we can obtain a logarithmic uh, parallel time or logarithmic uh, round complexity algorithm, okay? Just by simulating the classic Perham algorithm from it. Uh, another uh, algorithm that uh, obtained, or a set of algorithms that obtained number of rounds, which was in this setting when the space is equal to n to power delta, uh, which was constant, uh, uh, was our work from 2014. Uh, it applied to problems such as minimum spanning tree and f over distance, but it really applied only to geometric graphs. So these are graphs which are implicitly designed by a set of points and the distance in the corresponding matter. So it is not really on the combinatorial graphs. Okay, so for uh, for the situation when the space is equal to n, uh, let's say number of vertices to power delta for small delta, these are really the, the only results for uh, for general graphs. Um, and uh, but there are more work uh, done when the space is somewhat larger than our ideal n to power delta. Uh, in particular, if our space is a little bit larger than the number of vertices, so it is n to power epsilon, which is still less than let's say, the number of edges uh, or the total space, uh, then it is possible to solve, uh, let's say, connectivity and meaning spanning tree and some other problems in constant number of rounds, okay? Uh, so here, uh, note that this result really only makes sense for graphs which are relatively dense, so where the number of edges is at least uh, n uh, number of vertices to power one plus epsilon. Okay, more recently, uh, a nice set of work uh, managed to break through this bound of n and they uh, obtain algorithms uh, that uh, can use space per machine to be a little bit less than uh, linear in the number of vertices. So it is n divided by polylog n and they obtain the number of rounds which is log log n to some constant. So uh, some of these papers uh, obtain some log log, log 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 n to some power and then it has been improved in subsequent papers. And it applies to problems such as approximate uh, maximum matching and vertex cover. Uh, so these are really the, kind of the results so far. Uh, and you know, obviously, this kind of the, the obvious question or the main challenge that, that remains um, that was you know, basically since the uh, since the first uh, simulation of the Piram algorithm in the NPC model for connectivity, uh, the main question that you know, has been there for now for a number of years, is to obtain MPC algorithms uh, for graphs, which run in number of rounds, which is much less than logarithmic, uh, when the space per machine is really less than less than the number of vertices. So it's n to power one minus some constant, ideally s uh, n to power delta. Okay, and this is not known even for connectivity. In fact, it is not even known whether we can get such an algorithm to distinguish these two cases where we have a graph which is one big uh, cycle versus a graph which is, compa uh, contain, uh, is composed of two uh, cycles of length roughly n by two. So we don't know how to, uh, the best algorithm to do this when space is uh, satisfies this bound is logarithmic in n just by simulating a classic Perham algorithm. Okay, and uh, in fact, uh, there has been uh, uh, work proving that log log n bound is uh, necessary uh, for a restricted set of algorithms. Think of algorithms that basically are allowed only to send around edges, but are not allowed to do any kind of coding, for example. Uh, so the hardness of this problem, in fact, suggested to, to use this particular problem as a hard problem uh, to prove conditional hardness of some other problems in the NPC model, okay, which was done uh, in these two papers. Uh, and, uh, you know, of, of course, we'd like to prove general our bounds. You know, I, ideally, it would be a very nice result to prove that in general, uh, we, uh, any algorithm requires log log n uh, rounds uh, to solve the connectivity. Uh, unfortunately, uh, this is this seems to be a very hard problem because a general lower bound uh, in NPC model uh, would imply some circuit lower bounds, which we know is a very hard problem uh, technically, and we don't know how to uh, prove these kind of statements at this moment. Okay, uh, and uh, somewhat a side remark is. Uh, um, that this space per machine being proportional to n and whether we are above this barrier or below this barrier seems to be a natural barrier in a related model, namely the streaming model, 
Um, and uh, in particular, it is a barrier because uh, we know that many problems, including connectivity, uh, cannot be solved when the space is less than the number of vertices, but many problems, suddenly many more problems are solvable when the space is a little bit larger than the number of vertices. So including connectivity, but many other uh, nice problems. In fact, this barrier is so fundamental for graph promise in the streaming model that there is an actual name for the streaming model which has space a little bit larger than n and it's called this uh, semi-streaming model okay um if uh, I, mean, I won't mention streaming model uh, anymore in this talk so so i won't go in more detail here okay so this is the state of the art and you know what is our main result so our main result is uh, to design faster mpc al connectivity algorithms uh, for graphs which have additional structure. Uh, in particular, we uh, focus on graphs uh, which have small diameter D, okay? Uh, so big uh, capital D will always uh, represent the diameter of a graph. And uh, formally, we prove the following theorem, but for space, which is uh, as we'd like to be, it to be, n to power delta for some constant uh, delta, uh, we can get uh, an MPC algorithm for solving connectivity on graphs, which runs in... Uh, 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 in uh, order log d times log log n rounds. Uh, and in fact, uh, it can obtain a kind of clean uh, log diameter rounds if the number of edges or the total space is at least, um, is larger than the number of vertices by some polynomial. So it is at least n to power one plus epsilon. Okay. So this is, this is the main result. And you know, this is what I will uh, talk about for the rest of the talk. Uh, and uh, I should mention that, you know, having algorithms, uh, runtimes depend on D is something, a, a natural consideration to have. Uh, in particular, there was a paper in 2013 that uh, proposed an algorithm and conjectured that, uh, in fact, the algorithm runs in log diameter rounds. Uh, it turned out that their algorithm does not obtain actually log diameter rounds, uh, but it was a problem that uh, appeared, uh, it, it was a parameterization of a graph that appeared before. And of course, being having runtimes depend on the diameter is something which is very common in distributed algorithms where you know, there is a natural lower bound that your runtime has to be at least uh, proportional to the diameter of the graph in the distributed algorithms. Alex? Yes. Um, sorry, just to get some questions here. Okay, uh, thank you. Yes, yeah, uh, I, I, I love questions. <laughs> yeah, and uh, everyone here, please do ask questions because my questions are usually stupid. So, I encourage others to ask questions. If you if you're saying that if M is bigger, like is big enough, then it helps you somehow. But how can that be? I mean, I can artificially add edges without changing connectivity. Right? I could put a it, big it, yeah. It there. is. Uh, it, it means that my space is larger. Right, remember that my space, so the, the system, the entire system, so the space over all the machines is at least the input size. So if I have many edges, this means my, my total space is large. I see. So S is just for one machine, is then to delta, but then you basically effectively have more processors when M is bigger. Thank yes, you. yes. Thanks. Yes, yeah, exactly. If you fix S kind of to be under power delta, meaning having more edges, this means that you, you must have more machines because you have to somehow store the input at least. Right, of course. Thanks. Uh, and and the way the input is partitioned, you said it, but can you say again? How is it partitioned among uh, the processors? It's arbitrary at the beginning. So you cannot choose it. It's given to you in worst case. Yes, it's it's okay. uh, yeah, it's worst case. Yeah. Thanks. I mean, usually you can, in, let's say, in one or a couple of rounds, you can resort things. Um, you know, for example, sorting is a uh, is a primitive that you can do in constant number of rounds in in this model. No, again, not the point of the stock, uh, but usually you can resort. So, you know, without loss of generality, we might as well assume that it's an arbitrary. And we'll see, I, I'll talk a little bit about of the implementation kind of, right? right. Uh, a little bit later in one slide. Uh, okay, yeah, right. thanks. Thanks. Okay. I have a question here? Yes. Hey, Alex, so you mentioned MPC and you compared it to PRAM, but there are other models of uh, distributed algorithms, such as, uh, for example, congested click. How do they compare? Uh, good question. I won't be able to answer it uh, online um, since I don't know them that well. Uh, but uh, I think those all—I mean, those models naturally. So there are more distributed models, right? Uh, in distributed models, uh, the general difference is that uh, if we have uh, the graph itself, 
uh, also does not is not only the input, but it's also a restriction on how the machines can communicate between themselves. All right, so this is the usual restriction in distributed algorithms that you can only communicate to neighbors, you cannot communicate to anybody else. Whereas I mean, here, well, in a sense, we can communicate to anybody else. Yeah, but in the click model, it's exactly everybody can communicate with everybody else. So, uh, so when I, I, I don't know the details uh, of that okay. model, to be honest. Uh, maybe I can, I can take it offline. I, I just, you know, if you tell me the model, maybe I can say what are the differences. Okay. So I have it a feels like maybe we should do it at the end of the talk. Hello, uh, I have a question. Yes. So I don't know if you can hear this. Uh, is there yes, yes, I can hear. Yeah. Uh, okay. So my I'm Gopal from University of Houston. Actually, that's the Razor group. Actually, so I'm Razor as my student. So, uh, so one question is I think he's asking the congested click model. There, it's, uh, it was recently shown that two of one rounds can be done. So that's obviously optimal. So for MST and connectivity. But what I'm asking is there's something called the K-machine model. I'm one of the I mean, authors of that. It has been there for a while. I mean, you also code this model. I think it's, in, in some sense, it's more realistic than the MPC model. But in some sense, it also subsumes it. Subsumes it uh, okay. and, and basically, the kind of result that you're showing here is also sort of implied there. Of course, there, we don't care about log factors. But basically, the SPA paper that you quote, I mean, we show that connectivity and MST can be, show, show, can be solved in optimal number of rounds, basically n by k squared rounds where n is the number of nodes in the graph, it's regardless of m, the number of edges is irrelevant, and uh, the k is the number of machines. So basically, it's, it's the optimal thing, n by k squared is optimal. Of course, there are log factors. Of course, here the main game is to play with the log factors. The log factors are, uh, we don't care about it because n by k are like, it's much larger. But the point is it's more realistic because there it's, uh, and that's one of the reasons why MPC and M uh, MPC and MapLB models, they are not that relevant in the reach now. Because in the Pradel model, you don't set everything. So in MPC model, you completely shuffle everything. That's not smart. Uh, so Park and Pradel, they don't use that. Uh, they don't use that thing. I mean, the, 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 because they don't shuffle everything. I mean, that's completely costly. I mean, so it's generally map reduce kind of thing is not used for graph algorithms because of this shuffling thing. So they are good for constant round algorithms. That's where a map reduce is just do for constant rounds. It's okay, but for more number of rounds, uh, the K machine model type algorithm, which models Pragel and Spark kind of uh, systems. I mean, that is more realistic because you only send what is needed. You don't basically transfer the graph, shuffle it up. So there's no shuffle operation. Basically, you try to minimize the number of machines, the number of messages, communication that is going across every round. And uh, I mean, and that model, I think you quote that, but I you don't mention it. But I think this is a much. This is also a very I would say a very relevant model. In fact, it's more relevant than MapReduce and MPC to the K-machine model. So that's, that's what I mean. Uh, yeah, and I mean, I understand. And um, I mean, you're right that there are models which are more specifically, or systems which are more specifically designed for graphs, uh, for graph algorithms. Uh, I mean, I don't know of a formalization of those models which are substantially different from MPC. Um, so this is a so, for a while. You quote it, it's, it's also, I just checked your the paper. I mean, it's one of the citations. So this was, this was your first uh, proposed in SODA to 2015. So it's sort of I mean, more recent. And okay. then uh, so the, the actual paper you quote is in SPA. So in SPA, we show the algorithm the O of N, O tilde N by K squared algorithm. So, uh, so, right. So I do care about so whether so the number of rounds is logarithmic or constant. Yeah, so it's a, it's a generalized model than the congested click. So the congested click has been around for a while, but it's completely unrealistic for big data because you can't assume that there are n number of nodes uh, for n machines. Okay, you can't assume there are n machines, there are n nodes, right? If n is large, that's completely unrealistic. So, so in the K machine model, we take this. Yeah. Line because for the non experts, this is not very useful. You're welcome to stay here after the talk, but I'd like Alex to continue now. Um, so let's just take this offline and focus more on questions for now. And after the talk, we uh, we should have some discussion like that. So uh, if if that's okay, let's let's try to continue. Yeah, I'm, I'm happy to discuss this after after the talk. And I mean, at the moment, this will be the model. This will be, will be focusing. And you know, of course, you know, you know, after that, we can discuss about. Uh, algorithms which try to minimize the communication per round. So rather than having kind of all all out kind of communication to try to reduce that communication, it's a natural goal. Um, but we can discuss later on uh, about this. 
Okay, so so continuing, I should mention that there is uh, independent parallel work. I mean, it, it, I guess it's only proper that there will be a parallel work on parallel algorithms um, that obtain uh, faster algorithms for connectivity on graphs, uh, for graphs which have special properties. Uh, so one, uh, people obtain, obtain uh, algorithm that runs in uh, log log n rounds for graphs which have a good spectral gap. Uh, so think expanders, for example, uh, and uh, there's another paper which obtained log log rounds for random graphs, uh, which again uh, would also likely have good spectral gap. Uh, I should mention that our result in for these two type of graphs uh, will obtain a log log n squared uh, number of rounds, um, just by kind of standard connection between uh, a diameter and uh, you know what properties these graphs have. Um, okay, so uh, so I'll, do, I'll, I'll talk about the algorithm now. And uh, the algorithm is based on a kind of classic idea from uh, uh, for designing parallel algorithms for graph problems. Uh, and it is based on leader contraction framework, which was uh, particularly uh, brought to the MPC world kind of by this paper. Uh, and uh, this leader contraction framework works as follows, okay? So uh, at the beginning, we have a graph, and the algorithm proceeds in stages, in iterations. And the uh, graphs of different iterations will be called G1, G2, and so forth. OK? And we'll continue these iterations until there are no more edges. So until we get a graph where there are no more edges. OK? And what we do in the, each iteration is uh, the following steps. First, we choose a random set of leaders uh, from the current vertex set. OK? Uh, then for every non-leader, uh, we'll select one of the edge set leaders and contract into that uh, edge set leader, if one exists. If it doesn't exist, then the leader, non-leader doesn't do anything, okay? And the graph that is uh, for the next stage will be the graph where we have, we have performed these contractions, basically the contractions of the non-leaders into the uh, some edge set leader, okay? And at the end of the day, when there are no more edges, uh, we get a bunch of isolated nodes. And each surviving node uh, corresponds to a connected component, basically, which uh, is exactly all the nodes that contracted into V, uh, directly or indirectly. OK, so this is the algorithm. And I'll just go through the uh, for an illustration in the next few slides. Uh, OK, so let's say this is our uh, graph, G1. This is the graph we start with uh, on nine nodes. Uh, so, so we proceed in stages. So in the first iteration, we pick a bunch of leaders. So let's say these are the leaders, uh, the, uh, the stars are the leaders. Okay, and now for every non-leader, so every node which without a star, we, we need to choose a leader which is adjacent to it, uh, if one exists. So for one, there is no adjacent leader, so we won't do anything. Uh, for three, there are two leaders, and let's say it chooses one of them. Uh, oops. Um, for four, there is exactly one leader, so it must choose that leader. Uh, now we go to two. Two again chooses one of the two leaders, one of the two options. Uh, five doesn't have any uh, adjacent leader, so it doesn't do anything. And now we contract all the nodes. So this G2 is obtained from G1 by contracting all these non leaders which have an adjacent leader. So in particular, three, four, and two nodes have been contracted. Uh, and um, of course, this contraction operation also uh, inherits the edges. Uh, so the graph G2 that we obtain is the following graph. Uh, okay, so, so this is uh, first iteration. So now we continue the next iteration. Sorry, uh, sorry for animation being a little too fast sometimes. Um, so uh, this is the graph G2. Again, we choose a bunch of leaders. Let's say uh, these three nodes are the leaders. Uh, now, for non-leaders, basically, these three nodes, 8, 5, and 9, will choose uh, uh, edges and leader. So let's say 8 chooses this as a leader, 5 chooses this is the only option for it. Again, uh, same for 9. Uh, and we obtain uh, G3 by uh, contracting uh, these three nodes. And we obtain this graph, 1, 7, and 6. And then in the last iteration, we have uh, these three nodes. We choose a leader. Let's say 7 is a leader and we contract the two nodes into adjacent leaders. Uh, so the graph G4 that obtained will be just the node seven. Okay, and there are no more edges in this graph, uh, so we are done. And uh, we know that all the nodes that were, all the nodes were contracted in seven, first of all, 
uh, and uh, this means that all these nodes are part of a connected con uh, connected component to Gabriel Seven. Okay. So, a quick question. Uh, yes. So this is the random mate of re random mate algorithm, right? Which is well known. It gives you log and run. Yeah. Okay. The, this is the random meta. Yeah, so this is, yeah, this is, yeah, I'm describing a previous algorithm. Yes, this is a classic idea that has been used many times since 80s, indeed, yeah. Um, yeah, so, so, but this is the framework. I mean, our algorithm will use this framework and, and do something in addition to that. Okay. So let's do, uh, uh, so first of all, before doing analysis of this algorithm, let me, uh, describe perhaps a little bit more detail how you would implement such an algorithm in the MPC model. Um, so the general rule of thumb or how you should think about this is that any edge local operations can be done in uh, order one round. So a little bit like in distributed algorithms, uh, except that we may change the graph structure from time to time. Uh, as long as the total space bound is, is satisfied. So at some moment we'll be adding more edges. So as long as we don't add too much so that the total space bound is, is violated, we're okay. Okay, this is the rule of thumb. And let me just go into a little bit more details and for example, show you how to, um, roughly how you'd handle one iteration of the leader contraction in constant number of rounds. Uh, so the general principle is that each node and its incident edges, let's say node two and the edges from two to eight, two to five and two to six uh, will be assigned to a handler machine. So let me just call a handler machine. And of course, one machine can be handler for a bunch of nodes. Um, okay. And the handler for mach uh, machine for vertex V will basically do operations that are local for this vertex V. Uh, in particular, it has to choose, let's say it, it tosses a random coin to choose whether V is a leader or not. And if it's a leader, then it communicates this to the handlers of its neighbors. So if two happens to be a leader, then it will communicate this to eight, five, and six. Um, uh, if, uh, if V happens to be non-leader, then it has to select a unique adjacent leader. Um, so if, if two is no leader, then uh, after it has learned from eight, five, and six, whether they are leaders or not, it will choose one of them uh, uh, to be the preferred leader. Uh, and uh, once it has the preferred leader, it will send its incident edges uh, to that leader, basically for the contraction operation, uh, stores that V is in the same connected component to the leader and so forth, this kind of local operations. Okay. So one issue, one of these issues is that what if there is a node whose degree is very large? So in particular, it is much larger than the space bound per machine. Um, so in particular, this amount of information does not fit in a single machine because uh, a node potentially may have a degree which is something like n, whereas the space per machine will be, let's say, root n. So what do we do in this situation? Uh, so in this situation, we uh, store this information in distributed fashion. So in particular, uh, for one such node, you know, basically large quantum, uh, 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 shouldn't use the uh, word quantum, um, uh, one piece of information, if it's too large, then we'll partition between many uh, handlers, in particular, uh, let's say D by S handlers. And then the processing of these operations will be done via a tree uh, of depth log basis of D. Uh, which is a constant, again, because D is bounded by N and S is at least a polynomial in N, pretty much like we did with the XOR operation. So for example, selecting a unique leader uh, will can be done in log base S of D rounds uh, via the same tree that we used for, for doing the XOR operation. Um, and... Uh, um, um, and uh, I guess one, one last mention about the implementation is that, you know, how do we do the assignment to handlers? Uh, so if let's say Max... Hello? Yes? So is the, how is the graph distributed? Is it completely by edges or partition by edges or is it like in a vertex-centric pattern? So for example, in the K-machine model, we use vertex-centric. I mean, all the nodes with, and its incident edges are in the same machine. Of course, here up to the, up to the space constraint. So is it like that? I mean, how is that? Uh, so, uh, I mean, the MPC model does not have a restriction how we how we store the the graph. Um, I mean, any reasonable way, I mean, is okay. Uh, what I'm describing here is how 
I mean, the algorithm you know, uh, would implement such an algorithm. So it is, it is not, an, uh, what I'm describing here is not an absolute must that MPC model must do, but this is one way to do things and it's a relatively common for MPC algorithms. Okay, so in particular, uh, it is normal to store, uh, let's say, node together with incident edges together, but they may not fit. I mean, this is, in a, I mean, in a sense, it's a pretty big deal and it is important to deal with this issue uh, that the node and incident edges may not fit on a handler, on one machine. So then the uh, storing of a node with its edges is distributed as well. So we use D by S handlers and then processing, let's say, selecting one of the neighbors uh, between uh, between D of them should be done in a tree, in a tree fashion. So kind of in the leaves, we first select between local neighbors. We select one and transmit to machines on the next level. Then they select among, you know, the ones that it received, it selects the next one and so forth. So it's kind of uh, an OR operation that you would implement in a tree exactly in the same fashion as I described the XOR operation. But it's not necessary that if a node has it's not I mean, it's, uh, it depends what you mean by not necessary. As in the MPC model, I mean, does not have, uh, does not enforce anything. It is our choice of how to design algorithms. But so is the algorithm based on the worst case distribution of the input or like a... Yeah, yeah, the algorithm is always based on the worst case graphs. So it is, you know, kind of classic kind of theory theorem, basically saying that for any worst case graph, we get this bound. So this in particular means that there may be, for example, nodes with degree, which is almost linear in N. In particular, this means that the, all the incident edges to this, all the edges incident to a node may not fit into a machine. And at the beginning, we assume that the input is distributed in arbitrary fashion. I mean, of course, respecting the space bound per machine. So the edges could be permitted in, in arbitrary worst case fashion at the beginning. So then how do you elect leaders? So your node may not uh, so if you just for example show by edges so it's an R between the edges. Then sorry uh, I cannot hear it well. Suppose it is an R suppose it's you store it by distributing edges arbitrarily. So every every machine gets let's say a equal part of the equal partition of the edges. Right. Then uh, you right. think a leader is you have to elect it has to be consistently agreed that the same vertex is the leader. Uh, right. So, at the, uh, so uh, we need to first assign kind of at the beginning each node and its incident edges will be assigned to a handler machine, and this is done in a constant number of rounds at the beginning. Oh, okay. So this is so, okay. This is a standard pre-processing step. Yeah, it, in a sense, it's a standard trick. Yeah, you you think about this as this, this is pretty much corresponds to sorting. Let's say we're sorting by key, which is equal to the node. So then all the, so first of all, you duplicate each each edge, you duplicate twice because it will appear once incident to one node, one vertex, and once incident to the other vertex. Um, and uh, um, and then you sort, for example, by, uh, by the node. So this means that all edges incident to a particular node will be consecutive. So we will be on a machine or on two machines. Or if it doesn't fit on a machine, then it will be on many machines, but then we have to be processing that node a little bit more carefully via this tree of, of this depth. Okay, and in particular assignment to handlers can be done uh, either in random fashion if the maximum size of this information block, by information block, I, I mean this red uh, square, basically the, all the neighborhood of a node. If it's uh, if all of them are less than space bound, then we can just distribute them randomly, and then kind of uh, usual kind of bin packing arguments will tell that you know all machines will roughly have the same load in a sense. They'll handle roughly the same amount of information. Or if uh, this max size after, for example, this partitioning is uh, roughly close to the space bound, then you know random is not good enough because it will introduce another log. Uh, so then you know usually it is done by more careful load balancing. Um, and this is kind of a common thing for systems in general. Um, so, okay, in, so yeah, in the random weight algorithm, the leader is selected with probability of, so each node is selected with probability of. What is the probability here? I, I'm getting this on the next slide. Perfect question. 
So let, let me let me go on with this uh, description. So this is about the implementation. I won't describe much more about the implementation, but we'll describe the algorithm in slightly higher level de uh, level detail. So uh, so how many iterations? So let's do an analysis for lidial contraction. So how many iterations do we need to do? Uh, so the number of vertices in the graph in the next iteration is exactly the number of leaders because the leaders survive for sure, as well as the non-leaders, which have no edge cent leader in the graph. Okay, uh, so suppose that probability of uh, be being a leader, of, uh, of uh, a node being a leader is exactly a half. Uh, then in expectation, the number, uh, the fraction of uh, nodes that survive will be upper bounded by three quarters. Okay, and uh, why is this the case? So for every vertex that survives in, uh, in the next iteration, uh, with probability half it is a leader, so when it definitely survives, with probability half it is non-leader, okay? And uh, it may happen with probability, if that node happens to have degree one, and uh, then there is another probability of a half when its node is a leader or not a leader, okay? And the node two, I mean, in this case, for example, node two, with probability half will, will contract into five, but with probability half it will uh, survive. So overall it will be half probability from here plus a quarter from here. And therefore the number, the fraction of surviving nodes will be upper bounded by three quarters. So this means that at least in expectation, uh, in expectation in log n rounds uh, will be done. Basically there will be no more edges uh, or the number of nodes drops below one. Uh, which is not possible. So there are at most log n rounds, okay? And uh, if you think for it, uh, basically this is pretty much the best possible for a graph, which is a power graph. So if we have a graph, which is a very long line uh, composed of n, n nodes, or for example, it's a, uh, it's a cycle of length n, uh, then this is the best possible, okay? There is, you know, you cannot choose probability of being leader uh, differently to improve this number of rounds to be below log n, okay? This is exactly why it, it was hard to distinguish with one cycle versus two cycles uh, problem. Okay, so this is uh, this is the situation. Uh, but you know, as already suggested, uh, what happens if the degree is uh, is large? So if we have a lower bound of the degree, and say for example, each node, let's say this node two, uh, has a sufficiently high degree at least d, uh, then we can choose uh, we can set the leader probability, the probability of being a leader, to be much smaller. Okay, so for example, you know, here it, it will be, let's say, it's enough to choose leader probability to be roughly a quarter to have a uh, kind of reasonable probability that two will have an uh, adjacent leader. Okay, so this is, and you know, basically this will be uh, the idea. Um, so let's, let's uh, explore this idea further. So suppose we do what you know. Uh, we do leader contraction in a graph which is a high degree graph. Okay, so in particular, uh, think that suppose that all degrees are at least d, and think of this d as being sufficiently large. Okay, N not a constant, but let's say polynomial in that. Uh, so in in that situation, we can set leader probability to be let's say roughly proportional to uh, sorry. Uh, to log n by d. Um, and in this situation, then, uh, with half probability, uh, we have that the number of leaders will be order log n by d uh, fraction of the vertices. So the number of leaders will be a very small fraction of the uh, vertices that we started with. And uh, at the same time, every known leader, uh, just because it is uh, adjacent to at least d nodes, uh, each of this probability of being a leader, every non leader will have an adjacent leader with high probability. Okay, so this means that uh, uh, this means that the number of uh, uh, vertices in the next round drops by this fraction. So, I mean, if you think of d as being very large, then it will drop by a fraction which is roughly proportional to the degree. So this means that the higher the degree we can get here. Uh, in, in, in our assumption, the faster we make the progress, the faster the graph uh, size drops. Okay, so this will be our, sorry, uh, my PowerPoint uh, jumps ahead. Um, so this will be our new strategy. In particular, we'll do a step 
that I call densification, namely it will be a step that increases the degree of, uh, of all nodes uh, uh, above certain threshold, and then we do leader contraction. Okay, and this will be uh, uh, the, uh, the iteration. So we'll do desiccation, leader contraction, then I can desiccation and leader contraction. And basically, this is, this is the algorithm that we get. This is uh, pretty much the same algorithm that I uh, showed uh, when describing the leader contraction, except these two uh, red boxes, uh, which I'll call the process of densification. In particular, before picking the random set of leaders and then contracting the no, uh, non-leaders, uh, we will convert the, uh, the graph, the input graph GI, into GI prime, uh, which will uh, have a mean degree at least some bound GI, which is a number we'll fix later, uh, and will respect the same connected components as the graph GI. Okay, so we'll basically add many more edges to increase the degree uh, to some bound GI. And then we'll choose the probability to be a leader to be, you know, basically as I suggested in the previous slide, uh, it will be log n by di, and maybe we'll take minimum between half and this one, if di is not high enough. Okay, this is this is the main algorithm, and uh, now I will describe this algorithm now. Okay, other uh, questions at this moment? Okay. So, uh, so let me uh, first state the densification lemma. So the algorithm that uh, I'll describe in the, in the next few slides. Uh, so the densification lemma says that we can, uh, we have an algorithm, uh, an APC algorithm that can convert any graph G into G prime, which has uh, defined on the same vertex set, uh, has exactly the same connected components, uh, but has an additional property that each degree is at least some bound D. Okay, which is an input parameter to this algorithm. And the number of rounds will be logarithmic in the diameter. This is where the log diameter appears. Uh, and, uh, um, and the total extra edges will be uh, order of n d squared. So the, the graph will add more edges and the number of edges that is added is n d squared. Okay, note that you know, if we want to make every node to have degree D, then somehow we expect to add roughly ND edges, uh, at least in the worst case. Uh, we do a little bit worse, in particular it's ND squared, but it needs to be uh, good enough. Okay, so assume this lemma at the moment, let me finish the analysis of, uh, of our overall algorithm for the connectivity problem, and then I'll describe how to implement this densification lemma. Okay, so again, the algorithm, how does it do? It, uh, how does it proceed? We have a graph G1. We do the densification uh, step, which increases the number of edges. We form this graph uh, G1 prime. Then we do the leader contraction, uh, which decreases the number of nodes to obtain the graph G2. And then we repeat. So again, we'll obtain a graph G2 prime, which will do densification, in particular, increase the number of edges, then decrease the number of nodes and so forth. And we, uh, we alternate. Okay, so let's analyze this process. Uh, so total available space is uh, order n. Okay, uh, so remember this is kind of what we start with, uh, the number of uh, um, the space, the total space over all the machines is order m, uh, which is at least the number of edges. Right. This is uh, related to audience question earlier on. Um, sorry. Uh, so, in iteration i, our graph j has, let's say, n i vertices, okay? So this means that we can afford densification with a uh, degree di i to be roughly root of m divided by n i. Uh, by n i. This is because our densification lemma will produce total number of extra edges, which is order of n d squared. So, so that uh, if we want this bound to be uh, uh, about order m, we can set di i to be around this. Okay, most importantly, note that the smaller the number of vertices uh, it is, the higher degree we can afford. Okay, this will be uh, important. Um, so now we do leader contraction of in high degree graph, uh, which in a graph which has uh, degree di. This reduces the number of vertices to ni, which is roughly ni divided by di. This is, as I mentioned on the previous slide, um, that uh, now leader contraction is in a sense much more aggressive. Uh, and now, uh, you know, how does this 
you know, proceed. So uh, in an iteration, kind of, it's natural to look at this quantity, you know, to see how this quantity changes over the iterations. In particular, we look at the ratio between the total space available divided by the current number of nodes, and uh, an i plus one. So just uh, plugging in this an i, which is roughly an i by the i, we plug in into this formula, we get that this is equal to m divided by an i, so the previous fraction times the di that we can afford. Now we plug in this di, which is root of m by divided by an i, uh, we get that the new, the new ratio between the total space divided by the number of vertices increases by a factor, uh, by a power of 1.5. So whatever the previous fraction was, we raise it to power 1.5. Okay, and uh, uh, now how many times can you raise a number to a power before it becomes about m? Uh, this means that if we, uh, after log base 1.5 of log m rounds, uh, this quantity, this, uh, this ratio would be uh, uh, at least m. Of course, it cannot be more than m because uh, uh, the number of vertices has to be at least one. So this means that the total number of rounds will be at most log log m. So again, since m is at least m, this is, uh, uh, is polynomially related to m, this means that this is also log log m number of rounds. Okay, and uh, uh, overall we have log log m rounds of, of densification and linear contraction, and each densification step is uh, runs in log d uh, steps. So this means the total number of rounds is log diameter times log log m. And just to explain roughly what happens is that uh, uh, as we do, as we go through the steps, the size of the graph uh, drops, in particular, the number of nodes drops. And as the uh, size of uh, the number of nodes drops, this means that we can do much more aggressive densification. So we can add more edges. And the more edges uh, we add, the faster the leader contraction uh, uh, step decreases the number of nodes. So this is, in a sense, how we get, uh, how we get this bound. So the, the number of iterations of densification leader contraction is only log log m because there is uh, this exponential increase here. Um, okay, so, uh, and now let me describe this densification step, uh, the densification algorithm. Again, what we uh, we want to do is we take a graph and increase its, uh, add some edges so that the degree increases to at least d. The total space will be n d squared and it will proceed in log d rounds. Okay, and the basic idea is, uh, 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 I, I'll call it truncated broadcasting. It's related to some broadcasting algorithms uh, that were done in these models before. Uh, and uh, in particular, what it means is that, uh, you know, we want to add more edges while preserving connected components. So basically the, uh, um, uh, an unrestricted broadcasting will basically tell all the neighbors about all the neighbors that I know. Uh, so a node V will tell each of his neighbor in the neighborhood, so gamma V will be the neighborhood of V, will, will tell all the neighbors that it knows, and this will create more edges. So the neighbors learn about my neighbors, and uh, and this process will continue in iterations. Uh, and uh, we will send the set of neighbors up to D. So yeah, as soon as the set becomes more than D, we don't need to send more than D knows just because we just need to ensure that the degree is at least uh, this low, um, lower case D. Okay, and here is uh, uh, and here is how the algorithm uh, works. So we will have this neighborhood. Uh, it will proceed again in uh, in iterations. Um, so at the beginning we'll uh, we'll have gamma one to be uh, the node V together of all of its neighbors. Okay, and we'll proceed again in iterations. Uh, if if it happens that all the vertices have gamma, basically the known neighborhood to be at least D when we are done, I mean, this is exactly what we wanted here. Otherwise, uh, for each vertex V, if its, uh, its own kind of known neighborhood has size at least D when we're all set, so we'll just copy the same neighborhood in the, for the next iteration as well. 
Okay. Now, if this is not, not the case, but there exists some neighbor, so there is some u in the neighborhood of v whose size is at least d, right? so there is a very knowledgeable neighbor of, of our vertex v, uh, then uh, this node u will send its neighborhood and the new neighborhood of the node v will be its old neighborhood together with whatever my knowledgeable neighbor knows. Okay, and I'll put this a capital D just to denote that this is truncated to the item. So, you know, you doesn't have to send the entire neighbor, neighborhood, which can be very large of size n, let's say, but they can just truncate it to the items. Okay, and the third case is when neither of these cases happens. So, when the neighborhood uh, of V will be just the union of all the neighbor, uh, neighborhoods of its neighbors. Uh, so its neighbors just communicate to it all they know, and this will create the new neighborhood of the node V. Okay, and uh, at the end of the day, basically we output uh, when when this is done, uh, we output the graph G prime where edges are um, uh, the U where you know, for every node V and its neighbor U in the neighborhood of V. Okay, so. Um, I realize that it's two o'clock now. Uh, sorry, what is the procedure for being slightly out of time? Or uh, just don't ask. It's, yeah, go in if you need a few more minutes. It's fine. So okay. just, this this is where you get a d squared from, right? Because you have d neighbors, and each one might have d. Yeah. So I'll have illustration exactly on the next slide. Right. So uh, so this is exactly the same algorithm. So let me just illustrate exactly where the space comes from. Uh, so the case two, I mean, the first case is kind of obvious what happens here. I mean, we just don't do much. In the second case, let's say uh, V is the node six, okay? And nine is this very knowledgeable neighbor, which has very large neighborhood, let's say here. So what we'll do is kind of in this iteration, uh, the no node nine will send part of its neighborhood, let's say D is equal to four. So when the node six will create these new edges, this will be the you know, the additional, uh, the edges that we add to the gamma of the node six, okay? And uh, the the third case is exactly where also the this additional space will appear. Namely, node six is adjacent to many nodes. Each of them have neighborhood which have size at, at most D, otherwise it would be case two. Uh, and then it will create edges between six and all of its, uh, all, all of these vertices, basically distance two. Uh, from six, and this is exactly where the uh, space n d squared comes from, because uh, the maximal number of edges that can we can add to six in this way is about d squared. So there are at most d neighbors here to six, and each of the neighbors of each of the neighbors of six will have at most d neighbors by itself. So overall, it's order d squared. Exactly. Okay, and uh, basically this is the last algorithm, sorry, the last slide for the algorithm. Uh, so let me just uh, uh, quickly show why this runs in logarithmic uh, number of rounds, so log of diameter rounds. Um, so uh, it's actually a relatively simple proof, uh, and it works by induction. Uh, and in particular, we what we prove uh, by induction, the inductive hypothesis, is that the gamma of uh, i uh, plus one of v is uh, either already at the bound d or if it is it did not reach this desired bound d then uh, this is composed of exactly all the nodes at distance at most two to the power i from v where by distance i mean the hop distance right? this is unweighted graphs okay so and we can prove this by induction um, so of course this is true for i equals to zero uh, uh, otherwise, for bigger i, uh, consider, so we fix the node v, now fix some node x a distance at most 2 to the power i from our vertex v. Since it's a distance 2 to the power i, there must exist some node which is in the middle, basically a node u, which has distance at most 2 to the power i minus 1 from both v and x. So think about u as being the midpoint between v and x. Okay. And we either have that the uh, size of a neighborhood of u is at least d, and then this conclusion will follow by case two, namely, uh, in the next stage, the gamma i plus one of v 
will contain at least the neighbors from from this node u, which is kind of very knowledgeable. Okay, or if this is not the case, then x belongs to the by uh, by inductive hypothesis uh, gamma i of u is less than d. So in that case, x must belong to gamma i of u because it's a distance at most to the power i from it, as well as u must uh, be in this neighborhood of v. Um, and then by case three, gamma i plus one of v will be union of all the neighbors of neighbors. So therefore, the node x will be included in the gamma i plus one of v. Okay. So, and you know, once you believe this inductive step, this means that since all the nodes for any node v, all the nodes are within distance capital D, because diameter is D, this means that in log D rounds, uh, either for every node V, either its neighborhood must be at least uh, of size D, or it must have exhausted its entire connected component. Okay, and this, this completes the, uh, the analysis. Okay, so this is this is the last technical slide. The next slide is conclusions. Are there questions so far? Hello, a question. One minute. Sorry? A question, please. Yes. So one thing, one question is, is this the, this algorithm also works in PRAM? Uh, the algorithm um, um, sorry, no it, it won't because we cannot collect this information fast enough. So it won't give you better than login. No, no, it, it won't give you better than login. So what will it give you? I mean, will it give you anything better than uh, even for low diameter even for low diameter graphs? Uh, I don't know. I honestly don't know. So what, what is the second question? What is the consequence if the number of uh, edges, the space is only bounded to ND instead of ND squared? If you just show ND, then what, what will be the consequence? Uh, there won't be any, like some constants will be improved. That's all. Right. So it doesn't matter. Doesn't really matter, no. Uh, so let me uh, go to this uh, earlier slide. Sorry. Maybe, Alex, since we're running out of time, maybe you can get the okay, conclusion. Yeah, yeah. Some people might have to leave, and we can continue with some informal discussion. Yes, yes, good okay. So, okay. So the last slide. So you know, the main uh, statement that uh, I showed to you today is uh, that we can solve graph connectivity on graphs with diameter capital D in MPC model, where the space is arbitrary polynomial, uh, so n to power delta for a constant delta. And the number of rounds is basically log diameter times basically this quantity, which is at most log log n. Okay, and if n by n is at least polynomial in n, this becomes a constant. Okay, so it becomes just clean log d uh, number of rounds. Uh, so we also showed that similar you can obtain similar runtime for some related problems, so some you know simple extensions of connectivity, in particular spanning forest. DFS sequence and uh, the spanning tree, where the diameter now is respect to the diameter of the minimum spanning tree. And there are some natural open questions which remain, in particular to obtain a clean log D round, so without this additional factor. Um, also, whether it is possible to obtain deterministic algorithm. So far, it, this leader contraction algorithm very heavily relies on randomness. Um, and uh, the other kind of natural problem, kind of, you know, kind of the next uh, the next step in extension uh, that uh, feels like a very interesting problem to solve in the PC model is the shortest path algorithm. So given a graph and two nodes, find the shortest path. Uh, so uh, as, far, uh, as far as I know, we don't know even an approximate algorithm that would run in polylogarithmic number of rounds. So this is, you know, even independent of the log diameter rounds. So even in polylog n rounds, this is uh, doesn't seem to be known. And I'll stop here. Uh, thank you. Hey, thank you, Alex. Uh, so before we continue to the question session, um, let me just mention that, uh, oh, thanks everyone for joining. Also, 
we thank all the uh, viewers on YouTube. So we can't see you, but we know you there. So all 10 of you this time, thanks for joining through the YouTube uh, live broadcast. Uh, in two weeks, we have uh, C. Seshadri uh here uh and two weeks after that it's the last day of october it's uh, michal kutki um so um I, I realize some of you might have to leave but we are still here so we feel free to go on with some uh, uh questions to alex Any more questions? Yeah, I mean, just I want to say a little bit about the K-Machine model. I mean, I think it'd be good to com compare that uh, a little bit more with, uh, with the result here, because I think that's more realistic model than MPC, because it's a more, I mean, that's what captures things like Kregel and Spark. OK, I mean, I, yeah, I should probably be more uh, aware. I, I think I've seen it at some moment. Uh, a while ago, but I don't remember the details now. Um, I know it's a it's a different, uh, somewhat different model, but you know I'll be happy to kind of look a little bit more in detail and understand the exact details. Um, I, mean, I, I mean, I did look before, but I just don't remember now off the top of my head. That's uh, uh, say again. No, I decided in your paper. I just looked at it, but I didn't read the paper. I, mean, so I don't know in what context you are writing it. But... Mm -hmm. So this is a spa paper. I mean, there are, it is like a, there is a series of three papers. There are other papers, but the series of three papers. The original paper came in Soda 2015. The connectivity and MST algorithm came in Spa, and there's a recent Spa 18 paper on other graph algorithms, basically showing lower bounds and upper bounds on graph algorithms, like triangle enumeration and things like that, page rank and. Things. Okay. Okay. So I think I'll let you stay here. Discussions. Uh, I'll just turn off the broadcast. Um, so Google is not too angry at us. For <laughs>